Hello everyone, this is Samir from Audio Science Review. I thought I'd do a video on the, the whole area of uh, blind uh, audio testing, um, controlled listening tests, and listener training, critical listeners. Uh, there seems to be a lot of confusion, not just in one camp, but both camps, if you will. The truth is closer to the objective side, but uh, there's a lot involved in this that I'd like to cover. But let me start uh, telling you a story as some of the subjectives tend to do in their videos. I uh, arrived at Microsoft back in 97 and the first group I managed was the signal processing team. It was a group of about 20 PhD researchers and, uh, and engineers that were building audio compression uh, products at the time. And uh, I thought, okay, I'll, you know, let me go look out there, it's MP3s, what everybody's using. And I thought I'd go ahead and encode some file into MP3. And uh, having been an audiophile for 30 plus years, I thought it'd be a walk in the park, telling the difference between the two. I gotta tell you, it was a shock. <laughs> the MP3 file was about 8% the size of the original. So about 92% thrown away. That's what you get at 128 kilobits per second. Yet there was hardly any difference between the two. I, I was just shocked. I thought, hey, I just listened to it and instantly I can tell, you know, highs are gone or bass is gone or something's happened to it. And it was quite humbling experience. So uh, now when I read somebody says, oh, I've been an audiophile for 40 years. I, I, I know what I'm talking about. My ears tell me the truth. Uh, like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Being an audiophile doesn't qualify you to hear what I call small impairments, small non-linearities. If I take a file and change its highs and change its lows, we all hear that. So that is not in question. The tonality, we can all listen to two speakers and say, yeah, they sound different from each other. And uh, But when you take a file and either compress it lossy or you get into areas of amplifier distortion, DAC distortion, and cables, uh, we're talking about very small impairments or defects uh, down to potentially nothing. And uh, that's a whole other domain. People are not born equally, uh, whereas we are born very similar, by the way, when it comes to linear anomalies, the highs and the lows and everything. We tend to like similar things, despite what people think. Um, but back to small impairments, small artifacts, which I tend to cover in a lot of my measurements, we're not born equally. And that's what the story is about. So I was quite disappointed here. I'm managing this group that's supposed to develop lossy compression, and, and I can't tell what's what. And uh, so I thought, this is not good. Uh, I got lucky in that at that time, the focus was on streaming um, music and, and voice over dial-up modems. Uh, broadband was just getting started. And so we're interested in how good of a sound you can get at 20 kilobits per second, which is what you got on a 28k BPS uh, modem. And uh, I, I say I got lucky because at 20 kilobits per second, the artifacts are quite clear. Uh, you're, you're now down to less than half a percent of the music is kept. Uh, we butcher both the spectrum and fidelity to be able to get files to be so tiny. And uh, <clears throat> so that was good to hear what the artifacts are when they're magnified 1,000 times or you know 10,000 times. So that was helpful. Second thing was helpful was that I had a team that was building this technology so I could have uh, whiteboard discussions with them about what they were doing and how the process worked. I then started the reading, educating myself. I was fortunate that as part of my electrical engineering degree, I had taken signal processing classes, which at the time I didn't think were gonna be useful for anything. But uh, I sort of had that background so I could converse with my team and understand their terminology and, and what they were saying. And, and uh, I used that knowledge then to try to uh, understand what the artifacts were. Um, for example, in lossy compression, uh, we use a window a chunk of uh, music and that chunk uh, can clear artifacts where the artifacts bleed before a transient, and that's called pre-echo. So once you understand that, that the compression works on a frame and a frame at a time basis, and how uh, what we call quantization noise can bleed into the whole frame, and then what a pre-echo is, that was helpful. Uh, the third thing that was helpful is what we call codec killer uh, tracks. Uh, uh, international standards like MPEG, 
and uh, others were involved in developing lossy uh, compression algorithms. And as a result, uh, uh, researchers, engineers had found clips that were a lot more critical in showing artifacts. You could find thousands of clips where it would be fully transparent even with MP3 encoding. But there were clips that were the opposite, that would show pre-echo, that had the right conditions in them. Despite all that, it wasn't an overnight process. It took me, I'd say about four to six months to go from, gosh, I, I can't even tell what's what. It's like if you're not an ice cream taster and somebody puts you at the end of an ice cream manufacturing line and say, tell me if today's production is right. It's like, it all tastes like ice cream to me. To complete opposite where it became sort of child's play for me able to find these artifacts. And uh, it became known as, you know, golden ear, people called them, which I didn't like the term because I, I didn't think I had anything to do with my ears being golden. I uh, had simply trained myself and I knew technically what the artifacts would be. And, uh, and then I had this tremendous uh, feedback loop in that uh, when I found something, I could talk to my research team and engineers and then say, is this the case? And they would say, whoa, uh, let me go look. And they'd come back and say, yeah, there was a bug there and we fixed it now, listen. I'm like, yeah, now the artifact's gone. So I had this feedback loop and uh, examination, if you will, where I would think I know something and I would do the testing and then objectively my team would be able to confirm whether I was imagining some flaw in the, in the encoding or there was a real problem and they would fix the real problem so it was 100% proof something was wrong that I had detected these things. So it became a great satisfaction to, to be able to do this. So even though my job wasn't to do the work of my team, I would often be their sort of their uh, checkpoint where, where they would come to me a few months and say, I'm here, we've got a new encoder with a new psychoacoustics model. Can you test it? Can you do some critical testing? Um, that would put me through blind tests. It would put me through sighted tests. So I was always happy to do that. And I would enjoy finding these artifacts and uh, letting them know uh, what the problems were. So, <clears throat> one of the interesting things that came out of this training was that I didn't just learn to hear compression artifacts. I learned how to convert myself from a, an enjoying listener, an audiophile, to an analytical machine where I, I changed modes and I stopped paying attention to what music and its beauty is. Indeed, a lot of music that was revealing wasn't beautiful, but I would learn that, you know, you got to, you know, that laid back thing is not enough, that you got to focus and focus and, and understand and look for things. I would often create a loop of half a mil a half a second or quarter of a second or just one note, one guitar, ding, ding, ding. And I would just play it and I would do an A-B test and I'd say, ah, look, listen, right here, that uh, ding was sounding different. So you develop some inherent capabilities that you wouldn't normally have as an audiophile because I was becoming a tester and you know an analysis type of person. I guess the closest analogy is uh, when people lose their sight and they rely on their hearing more and they're able to pick up things or people can read lips. Uh, I can't read lips, but uh, clearly people can even understand you know what you're saying by just watching your lips uh, we don't you know we, we probably watch each other's lips to help with our comprehension but not to that level so training to become what i call a critical listener is super important and it is a hundred percent valid valid uh uh skill to have every top um, company to develop compression algorithms, Dolby's of the world, Apple and others. Um, actually, Apple wasn't part of one of those, but other companies that develop compression, they always had one or two people like me, or you know, if they're lucky more, but usually very few people that had just invested in time and energy and, and had the inclination to become good, and they relied on, on them. And, and you know, you go look at research papers, you will routinely see that they say, hey, we took a train, group. Now, the word training is misused sometimes. Uh, sometimes that's assumed to be ex experienced per listener. Uh, somebody mastering music is trained in listening for mastering. To me, that's not the same as being a critical listener. That same listener, despite having training, may have no ability to uh, be able to find small impairments. So just because you're trained in, in, in something doesn't make you automatically there. Um, you need to go through a process of understanding what artifacts they are, what the problems are, and then be able to uh, use that. Now, everything I told you just now, 
you should assume it could be garbage. I could have made all that up. I could have exaggerated all of this. Uh, indeed, I watch videos. I read things from companies that say, well, we've done a lot of blind tests. Ah, oh, we can tell. It's easy. I, I've had 10 years of training, listening to cables or listening to these wires, listen to this. And I can tell. And you can't tell because, you know, you're a newbie. You don't, haven't done the 10 years. So you should trust me and come buy this cable. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. That's like taking an exam and giving yourself an A <laughs> and saying, look, I'm, I'm, you know, I've got an A student. And I'm like, no, you, somebody else needs to grade you. In my case, I had my PhD researchers and developers actually testing when I said, hey, this thing is broken. Listen to this quarter second guitar string that's wrong. They would go and check. And sometimes they came back and said, nonsense, Amir, take this blind test. And I tell you, I would fail. To, I would tell them that there, there is something inside it, and then I would not be able to find it in blind. It would be quite embarrassing. And I can tell stories of that. So I had a feedback loop, just like when you go to school. There's a teacher that exams your grade, uh, your uh, grade your exams. You have to do that. So this notion that I've done this for ten years, therefore I can tell, is just totally nonsense. There needs to be some existence proof. So what existence proof is there for me? Well. When I've told these stories online, people have challenged me and they said, nonsense, you know, nobody can tell these differences. You're making all this stuff up. MP3 is transparent, so I don't know what you're talking about. So in, in the years of these battles going on with Objective is our own camp, um, I've developed, you know, I've taken tests that people have, have thrown at me. So let me show you some of those tests. Um, these are tests that are public, so I'm showing you the origins of them. You can go maybe find this. I don't know if in all cases the content's still there. I think most of them are there. One of them was uh, this uh, nice objectivist um, um, uh, online blogger called Archimago. And uh, he's a secret person, doesn't tell us who he is, but he writes very good articles. And his website's you know, popular, so I encourage you to go read his writings. He often puts out these blind tests, um, and uh, he put one out there called 24-bit, uh, that was about 24-bit versus 16-bit audio test. I did not see the test till the test was over, and so I did not participate in, in his test. Um, but I remember it coming up, somebody saying, you know, here's a test, could you have passed it? And uh, at the time, the files were still there, and I went and downloaded them. And, uh, uh, but before I tell you how I did, this was the outcome. He asked people an incorrect question, by the way. He asked them if they can tell which one's a better sounding one. And of course, people are all confused or, or the results were basically the same. Just as many people said the 16-bit sample was 24-bit that they said 24-bit sample was the 24-bit. So he then concluded that nobody can tell the difference between these and uh, partially is right. So if the fidelity of high-res music is, is so clear, therefore, you know, it should have been easy for people who are advocates of 24-bit to be able to tell the difference. But uh, I say he's wrong enough. Before we can say something's better, which is a preference, and we have no real uh, example there. Right? It's not like we had the live music and then we had the 16 and 24 bit version of it to compare. Uh, just two files and say which one's better. We can just imagine one being better and vote that way or imagine the other one being better and voting that way. And that's just placebo bias and, and just preconceptions getting in the way or, or luck and, and what have you. So I like his try, but it wasn't the fair question. The fair question would have been, um, well, let me put it this way. He asked the populist question, which is that people would just say, I can easily tell the difference. He's proven people can't easily tell the difference. But from my point of view, a more fundamental question is, what, would there have been any difference in these two files? Now, he was a cl clever son of a gun. He got help from a signal processing expert to solve a problem with his public test, which is what I call mechanical analysis. Somebody can take these two files, and let's say it's a high bandwidth file versus low bandwidth file, and bring them to an audio analysis program and instantly tell one is higher bandwidth than the other, 
and therefore the gig is up and they know the answer and they can vote accordingly. In this case, the sample rate was the same, so that game couldn't be played anyway. But he also went through some countermeasures with the help of a signal processing person to make it very difficult to actually and even analyze the bits and be able to arrive at which one's 24 bit, which one's 16 bit. So quite clever. And I can tell you that I did not do any mechanical analysis and I would have been happy to have you sit next to me or anybody sit next to me and I would pass the test. And I'm gonna tell you how I passed the test anyway. So hopefully you can go copy what I've done. So now this is the tracks they use. Now the de facto standard tool online, and unfortunately there's only one of them, is a, pro a player called Fubar2000. Um, it's a geeky player, so I don't use it for every day, but it has plugins and somebody wrote a plugin to do an ABX test. Um, ABX test it presents you the two samples, A, B, you know, the two that we want to know if they're different from each other, and then randomly picks A or B and calls them X. And your job is to tell whether X matches A or matches B, and you vote with two buttons. And uh, so whenever somebody's challenged, usually they're they demand, people demand to run this. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't run on a Mac. There is a Mac uh, ABX program, um, not very popular, but that exists. Um, and there's some issues with this plugin I'll talk about later on, but for the purpose of this, testing is not. So I gave it these two files and then you run it. And, you know, you can listen to A as long as you want, you can listen to B as long as you want, and you can listen to X as long as you want. You can immediately vote or you can take five days to vote. The program doesn't care. It just sits there waiting for you. And when you're done listening, you do that. So there's this notion of there's time pressure. There wasn't. Uh, I was sitting there by myself in, in my house doing the listening test. I was using a laptop with uh, uh, Etimotive uh, 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 IEMs. So good IEMs in air monitors, but uh, it, but nothing fancy. Laptop sound card, so this didn't require you know very high end and what have you. And uh, uh, as you can see, the way the report works is it gives you the timestamps. So you can see that uh, I started the test and it took me two minutes and then I was pretty quick so, uh, on this thing. But I could have taken, like I said, weeks and days. I'll explain later on what that's a bad idea, but, but I did. So I ran the test one out of one. I could tell the test uh, one out of one. I got it. And that means there's 50% chance, I guess, right? I could have said X was A or B and 50% chance I could get lucky. The second one, I actually failed. So the program penalizes back and says, no, no, no. You know, there's 75% chance you could guess because you got uh, two out of three wrong. But then, uh, as you can see, I kept up and I was able to guess correctly every time. And you can see the time stands uh, pretty close. So in eight or nine seconds, I could tell. And I kept taking it, taking it, taking it. And at this point, I stopped. You can stop it anywhere you want. And as you can see, I got 14 out of 15 right. So one miss over here. And usually, I, you know, you can lose your concentration. These are difficult tasks, so you got to focus. And all of a sudden, somebody talking, a dog barking, or whatever, um, you, you could get wrong. And also, one source of getting things wrong is I, I get forgetful. I push the wrong button, you know. <laughs> I know it's B, but I'm click A and boom, I was like, ah, oh, no. And there's no going back, you know, short of taking the test again. But anyway, um, as you can see, I got 14 out of 15 trials right. So the probability of guessing, it says 0.0, 0, .0 but it's actually 0, 0.0 some number. Um, it's a flip of a coin, so 50% chance your heads or tail. And how many heads in a row can you get before somebody can believe you that you can always get ahead. So it's a cooked coin, if you will. So by the time you get to 14 out of 15, you you know, I could still get lucky. So this could be luck, but uh, the probability of that is extremely low. So I would not bet against, the, against this person not knowing what they were hearing. Um, so how did I how did I pass this test? Uh, I can tell you that it's an impossible test for you to pass if you don't know what I'm about to tell you. I sat back and I, I first listened to just different parts of the cliff, the clips, and it was hopeless. I mean, they sounded the same. Um, then I sat back and I said, well, where does it matter to have more bits? It matters when uh, the amplitudes are dro dropping. So we've exhausted what 16 bits could do and we drop into what 24 bits could do. And uh, 
that if I could find such a segment and then I would turn up the volume because when amplitude is dropping, the thing is getting very quiet. I mean, I'd be able to hear what's down there. There may be differences, but if it's too quiet, I can't hear. By the way, using in-ear monitors that blocks outside noise is extremely useful as is being able to turn up the volume. So I went to the end of the track and got lucky because there was a fade to zero. And when one faded to zero, one had higher noise floor than the other. Boom, I knew what to listen for and managed to pass the test. So what allowed me to pass it? Technical knowledge. I understood what the difference between 24-bit and 16-bit was, that it's in the quantization noise, it's in the low bits, not in you know, channel separation or you know, transients or bass impact, none of those. Uh, it was where I knew the amplitudes are small, and if you divide up a small signal you know, into more parts than less parts, more parts are always better. So when the guy says, hey, I'm making these cables, I don't know how to measure anything. I don't really, can't even explain to you why it sounds better, but I can hear it. It's like, well, you can't do what I just did in this test because you don't know what to listen for. Yeah, you might think you do, but you don't because you have no foundation to know. If you had measurements and the measurements told you, hey, the frequency response rolled off above 18 kilohertz, okay, you could devise a test where you could tell. But if you don't understand the system, then you're screwed. And indeed, I would have been screwed if I didn't have this technical knowledge. And if you don't have this technical knowledge, that's why I say it would be hopeless for you. And indeed, it was hopeless for all those people who took this test. They did not know what to listen for. So did I cheat? You could say I cheated, but the purpose of a system for transmitting music is that it's transparent, what I call for all people, all listeners in all situations and all content. So to the extent in a fade, I could tell the difference. I could tell you 16-bit is not transparent. Done. And today, 24-bit costs nothing. All music is produced in 24-bit and then dumped down to 16. I'm like, give me the 24-bit. I don't want you to dump it down to 16. I'll pay for the extra file the size and let me listen to it and not ever have a condition where that happens. Now, again, if you threw me in the middle of those tracks, I could not tell. And if you didn't give me this tool where I could focus just on the last you know, a few milliseconds of a track and repeat it, I couldn't be able to tell it either. You know, just walking in, somebody says, hey, can you tell the difference in these? Uh, my answer would be, no, I'll, I'll be just as stupid and dumb as the next person. I shouldn't call stupid and dumb. But basically, I wouldn't be able to uh, perform any miracles in here. Now, you might say, well, this is one test. Maybe you got lucky. This one, you cheated and what have you. There's been a lot of these tests uh, published over time. Uh, Ethan Weiner is a hardcore objectivist friend of mine and does a lot to educate people about, you know, what's voodoo and what's real. And sometimes he creates these tests that are quite embarrassing for people in that he exaggerates the effects that people think, you know, are terrible in themselves. And he exaggerates them heavily and says, well, can you tell the difference now? And if you can't tell the difference when I exaggerate something tremendously, then you really, really hold. So this notion that the DAC sound different, that analog digital converters sound different than they screw up music, he went ahead, took a file, and in this case, he had a good uh, interface to focus right. And he looped, he played a file, music file on disc, played it, and then captured it with the same card. Played it, captured it, played it, captured it, played it, captured it. And, and he did different versions, one which was one generational loss, one that was five, and one was 10, and one was 20, whatever. Well, I tell you that hardly any audio file dared to take this test. If you just casually listen to it, you will not be able to pass it. I, you know, it's a tough, tough test. And in this one, I didn't take notes of what I found in there, but let me show you how I did on, on this test. You can see the starts with, you know, the same as, you know, I think I missed the first one actually. So it's telling me that I'm guessing completely. But as the test progressed, you can see that I finished down here and I got 19 out of 22 right with, again, you know, 0%. So 19 tells you that occasionally I, I did hiccup. If you go look in here, you'll probably find that. Uh, usually, yeah, you can tell in here where I was down to 1.1% chance of guessing and all of a sudden I missed one and got to 2.9%. So it took a lot of concentration. Tremendous amount of my listening skills were involved in in trying to find this. It wasn't such a, oh, you know, I'm just gonna whistle Dixie and pass this test. This was not easy. This was a one generation one, I believe, which was the hardest one. So ones that were 10 generations were a lot easier for me to pass versus the one generation. Sorry about the phone beeping. Um, 
uh, on this thing. So he then uh, had another one with uh, the really embarrassed people, which was the Sound Blaster, which people, you know, it's an older, you know, PC card that, you know, any high-end audiophile would have a heart attack if you told them how to listen to music through that. And uh, said, oh yeah, this is the pa a single pass one, which is the most difficult one. And uh, again, hardly anybody could take this test and, and pass it. And you can see that, that this one, I had no trouble. And from what I recall, it was, uh, this one was actually slight softening of the high frequencies. How did I know that? I thought about it. I said, well, every time you digitize this, there's an anti-aliasing filter that filters out the highs. And this being a cheaper card, it doesn't have the best anti-aliasing card. So I, I bet you there's some high frequency loss in there. And I managed to find it. Now, when I ran this test, I think, uh, let's say the date, uh, 2014, so six years. So I was still in my 50s. So uh, my long, high frequency was long gone. Uh, yet I was able to pass this, and this is not cheating. This is literally me listening and able to find that that's slightly different. So um, shows you that if you're a critical listener, you can get damn good at this stuff. So uh, don't go around waving your hands and nobody can pass all these tests. It's all nothing. You know, quality doesn't matter. Every, everything's the same. All digital is the same. I'm showing you that you know there are people like me that do hear this stuff and therefore striving for quality is a good thing. And by the way, it costs nothing to strive for quality. Uh, if you go to Audio Science Review website, you'll see that there's tons and tons of dirt cheap products that are superb way beyond anything in here. These are real degradations that we're talking about. They're, they're not esoteric things. So on this thing. So um, the late Arnie Kruger was probably the most staunch uh, objectivist. He was involved in the original a development of the APX tests, and he spent a lifetime fighting subjectivists online. And and I actually had a lot of fights with him because he would tell me that I, I can't pass these tests. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I try to state the truth, and I would try to pull him from that extreme position of you not just down and say, no, 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 you can't just keep saying, you know, a $10 DAC must be perfect, even though you haven't determined that it's perfect, I haven't measured and what have you. So he had these tests he created back in 1980s for jitter, and he took, he generated 30 hertz jitter. That means you take a DAC and you subject it to 30 hertz uh, variation. That creates two sidebands around every tone that's only 30 hertz apart. The uh, perceptual masking is extremely effective in covering that up. So indeed, if if you see jitter and you see spikes close to it, I'll always tell you it's inaudible because perceptual masking is because of that. And so these tests were not easy to tell, to hear. Nobody that I know took these tests but me. And uh, I went downloaded this file, and as you can see, 10 out of 10 times I could pass it. Uh, this is uh, also an opportunity to tell you about the new version, which now see it, it sort of doesn't say 0% here. Uh, some people start accusing me of cheating. They said, you could, uh, you could, uh, let me pause you. I'll be right back. Hi there, I'm back. Uh, perils of doing video during the day <laughs> when everybody's calling, what have you. All right, uh, let's get back to this test. As I was uh, explaining, this is a jitter test, but an extremely difficult one to pass. And because of the perceptual masking that uh, our uh, ear and brain apply. So uh, he created three different ones. I think I passed two levels of it. I could not pass the third one. And this is the second from the worst one. And uh, as you see, I managed to pass 10 out of 10. Very, very, very difficult to test to run. But uh, going back to why this display looks different than the previous ABX test is that people were accusing me and others to go in there and just use a text editor and make up these numbers, which you could. But obviously, when somebody like me posts under my real name, last thing I want to do is destroy my reputation and uh, by faking results. So I went ahead and used a new plugin that has a cryptographic hash in there. Basically, it's a checksum uh, of the uh, contents of the file. So we know the files haven't been messed with. And there's a signature, a cryptographic uh, signature that's generated for the, all of this together, which means that if you edit this file, uh, this outcome, the output, uh, you'll be able to use it. There's a tool that actually reads this file and tells you if it's valid. And uh, we can also apply, you know, find out if the two original source files were you know, messed with and then renamed as, as these two. 
Um, people still come back and say, well, Amir knows enough about this stuff that he can bypass that. Uh, give me a break. <laughs> it's not worth for me to even mess with the original thing, let alone this. So if you can't pass these things, it's understood. It does require scale. It doesn't mean I have better ears than you. It just means that, you know, I've done this work professionally. And even in difficult situations, I'm able to uh, the, dig in and find the differences. And as I mentioned, the, this top test was extremely hard to tell, and I could not hear. Um, uh, by the way, the, the team that builds this plugin continued to make it uh, harder for people to pass this test. And what they did was that, uh, I haven't run for a while, is that they stopped telling you how you were doing during the test. I think that's totally wrong. Um, we want to maximize the chances that somebody can pass these tests, not minimize it. It's not a game we're playing. If somebody's able to look and find out that they're on the right segment in the track that's revealing is hugely useful. We don't want to put our head in the sand saying, oh, let me see how I can tie your hands behind your back and then you see if you, how fast you can run. It's like, no, I've got a different parts of the file are impacted differently with, with jitter or different artifacts. And I listen to one section and I take the test. If I keep failing, then I stop and then I go and, and pass another, you know, test another section. If you take away this tool from me, it will just take forever to do this. Sorry, I had to pause you again. Dogs were uh, barking. Anyway, uh, I actually lied to you. This is the, uh, um, uh, I think this is like the highest one or next highest one. But anyway, there's a version of it that actually was even more difficult to pass. And you can see here, I started to struggle some. Now, um, from... Uh, Standards in the industry, if your probability of guessing is less than 5%, uh, that's accepted to be good enough, or we usually write as P less than 0.05. And uh, you see that very, very commonly in research paper on validity of, of listening tests. And I'm at 5.5. So, you know, it passes that test. Personally, I'm not as happy with it. I'd like to show you tests where it's so clear where this is zero, as close as zero as you can get, that, that it should be no doubt that I could pass that test. Uh, this one would be good enough for research, but not rising to my standard uh, on this thing. This was, again, a very difficult test of Jitter at 30 hertz, although the amplitude is much higher than the typical amounts that, that we see in, in, in these tests. Um, now, I've told you, I've sort of, some, up to now, we've been talking about some of the assumptions we make on the objectivist side, where such tests are impossible to pass, everything sounds different, that people can't test blind tests, and none of these people who claim to hear stuff ever take a blind test. Well, I've taken these blind tests, I've posted them many times, people have argued with me to death on them, and, and uh, they're there. So there's existence proof of life here. So don't be too cocky in saying, you know, nobody can pass anything, you know, let me just throw an MP3 at you and, uh, and see if you can pass this. Indeed, people have done that and I've passed those tests to their embarrassment. So don't go too far. You know, our argument is good, but not uh, bulletproof in some of these cases. Now, people say that the, uh, ah, these tests are no good. I can't pass them because there's a time pressure. As I mentioned, there's no time pressure. A program has no timer in it. You could take forever. Uh, but they said, no, 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 no. I really want to listen to these things, these things, or cable, whatever. Take it home and listen on my system, on my music, on my whatever. Well, guess what? That test has been done formally and it's published in an AES paper for which I've done a digest. I'll put a link in the des description. Um, it comes from this AES paper, Audio Engineering Society uh, paper, uh, and summarizes 10 years of ABX testing and, and what the results are. Um, most of you don't have access to those files, so I've taken it and I've carved out a key part of it, which is people argument that long-term testing is better than short-term testing, as I mentioned. I tell you, it is the absolute opposite of truth. If you told me to listen to all these files that I showed you, that I'm going to listen to one for days, and then I'm going to listen to the other track for days, I couldn't pass any of them. I'll make it even simpler. If you told me that I've, there's going to be 20 second laps between when I listen to A and then listen to B, again, I would flunk most, if not all, of these tests. The reason I'm able to find these differences is that I shortened the clip to very small increments and I looped it. So when I'm switching A and B, we have what is called echoic memory, which is 
almost a lossless recording in our brain where everything that comes in we, we record. And then after a while we say, wow, that's a huge amount of data. Um, we need to commit something to long-term memory. And what we commit to long-term memory is the most massive lossy encoder you could think of. It's like thousands of times, you know, compressed. You will hear, you will remember it was a female singer and maybe it was some guitar playing, but you're not going to know, remember all the nuance of everything you hear in life or you would go crazy. So we want to take advantage of the echoic memory because, and short-term memory, because it is far, far more accurate. So you want to have this A and a B in mind a, 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 just within that, you know, few seconds. People say echoic memory can last up to 20, uh, 20 seconds. I can tell you, even if like two or three seconds is enough for me to fail a lot of these tests. Uh, Harman does speaker testing, despite the large difference in speakers, there's like four or five second delay because they've got to shuffle speakers. I tell you, I'm dying there while I'm waiting for the next speaker to play. I'm trying to say, remember, 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 remember the last speaker, last speaker. Thankfully, the differences are massive there between speakers, so you sort of remember. But I tell you, it's crazy for people to say long-term listening is better. And, uh, but it's been tested. So um, Clark, who's one of the advocates and builders of original ABX tests, um, part of uh, this Detroit uh, listening group, and they had another audiophile uh, group uh, that was all these golden ear, high-end ones. And they had a competition and to see if in a blind test, people could tell the difference um, with a box that, that added two and a half percent distortion. So a lot of distortion. The high-end audiophiles immediately said, no, 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 no. I'm not going to even listen to the setup you have in here. It's beneath me. I'm only going to listen to this at home. I'm going to do my own long-term testing. I'm not going to sit down and do this AVX game you're playing with your relays. They're probably screwing up the sound more than the, you know, what you're doing. I'm not going to do it. So they changed the test, and they built these uh, black boxes. Ten of them they built. They were battery-powered, and uh, half of them had uh, um, distortion that they did, added, 2.5%. Half of them had passed through, so it didn't do anything. And they randomly gave this to both teams uh, of these audio files. Well, both of them came back afterwards, failed, could not identify either the pass-through one or not. So this long-term listening, take home and listen on your own system, your own content, everybody failed this test. So, you know, people who think they could do better by take home, they're totally wrong as long as the test is blind, right? Here they couldn't tell what the boxes were doing. And then, uh, but then they did a second test where they used the ABX comparator, comparator which just like the FUBAR tool lets you quickly listen to A, B, A, B, A, B, and then X. Boom, not only these guys uh, they were able to hear um, uh, the, uh, you know, 11 out of 18 people could hear this difference. They also went on later on, actually reduced the distortion, and they still were able to detect that uh, using ABX testing. That's fast, instantaneous testing. So there's no question whatsoever, both in research, and I'm telling you from my years and years and years of experience, that if you lengthen that time, your your toast, the kind of small distortions that we're talking about, and these are real distortion, two and a half percent distortion. Show me a power cable that has two and a half percent distortion added to your uh, audio system. It does not exist. We can't even measure what it adds to the system, let alone two and a half percent. And uh, anytime I'm challenged to do A-B testing, like HDMI testing is a nightmare because HDMI takes forever to relock and show another source. So if two sources in HDMI and I've tried, by the time the thing glitches, switching from channel, you know, from A input to B input, I'm gone. I mean, I can't hear the the difference between these things. So it's just an excuse people have saying long-term testing works better. Uh, why do they arrive at that? Because they go home and they plug in this cable. At first, they think it didn't sound good or it did sound good. And two months later, they decide on some other outcome. They say, aha, it took me two months to figure out what this cable was doing in my system. My answer is no, you have no idea what it did to your system because it wasn't a control test and you graded yourself. You said the highs got better, the veil was removed. Who says the veil was removed? You could say anything, maybe nothing was removed. And by the way, that's the heart of all these systems. We're taking human beings, they're totally unreliable instruments. Compared to my analyzer, a human being, even I, am a terrible instrument. 
when you're using me to test audio electronics, I'm going to feed you variable data, right? It's a subjective test control, but it's a subjective test. So we want to find out within the noise of the experimentation, what is real and what is not. So oftentimes we put controls in the test um, where we put in something that sounds a lot worse, like this two and a half percent box. And then we can tell if people can't tell the difference, then they totally host because they couldn't even hear the control where we know the answer. We know it added two and a half percent distortion. If you can't tell, that's the end of the discussion, but that's because we have the answer. We know there's a box with two and a half percent distortion. You buying a high-end cable, taking it at home and plugging it in and arriving at some conclusion, we don't know. We, we have no way of verifying that. We don't have the cable. We haven't measured it. We don't know what you... So what you're claiming you, you heard is of zero value. What is of value is that we test you enough times and then we perform a statistical analysis that says, aha, there is... 1% chance you you know you were guessing, or there was 100% chance you were guessing. Uh, lay people, by the way, they think, oh, I did a blind test, and I did it once, and I could tell the difference. Or I did it twice, I could tell the difference. Like, no. Uh, twice is not good enough. That's why I say you got to do 10 out of 10 times. You can't just, you know, declare yourself as, as you know, being right. And unfortunately, audiophiles always do this. They keep saying they're right because they've been an audiophile for so many years. No. These are differences that are supposed to be actually impossible to hear. So, and you're claiming with ease, you take these cables and you hear them. Uh, by the way, the expectation that the cable wasn't supposed to sound good, or whatever the tweak is, for that matter, not just cable, that I didn't expect it to sound good, but it did, or I expected it to not like it, and I like, none of that matters. That's all wording. Your frame of mind is just of no value to us. We just want to know if we can test you 10 times, so if you think this coaster under your amplifier made it sound better, let's make two coasters that look the same. One has the bits in it that you think makes sound good, one that doesn't. And then we'd have you do a blind test and do it 10 times. So, you know, if there was night and day, the veil was removed, great. You want to take six months to do this, take six months to do it. So uh, let me summarize them this a long video. Um, that there is such a thing as, as training. With training, you can get better if the differences are real. The training requires rigor, requires knowledge of the system, which is very complicated. Um, it is not Joe Blow saying, I've been making cables for 10 years and I know what to listen for. I know how to, you know, I've got this rack for audio and you put stuff in there. And I did it blind with somebody and they said it was fantastic. No, what he or she said, we can't trust. We've got to have a structure and a rigor. You know, people have that when they develop medicine. Same here. We don't just wave our hands and invent our own protocols. Uh, don't use the word blind, you know, just willy nilly. Uh, you know, blind means being able to demonstrate the protocol. First thing people ask, what, what does it mean? What did you do uh, on this thing? Did you match levels? Did, you know, what was the condition? What should, how did you test? And those details are seemingly never come. So, um, but also don't go the other extreme of assuming that nobody can pass any of these tests, that the small differences are no, you know, mean nothing. I've had people say, ah, 192K is good enough and nobody can tell. Well, you know, I can tell in, in, in these tests. So I'll have more to cover on, on this topic, but I was watching uh, the uh, founder of uh, JPS that makes his iron cables. Uh, keep mentioning that he's done blind tests and that he's... Uh, um, you know, he's done bail cables for 10 years and he's trained himself to, to uh, know what cables sound like, the different materials sound like what. Uh, yet he doesn't know how to measure them. He doesn't know how to correlate any measurements with anything and there was nobody there to grade them. So he just decided that he knew and knows now what different cables sound like. One, we can prove that those cables don't have sound. And the fact that he thinks he knows is not sufficient. We need to test them. And of course, he says blind tests are, uh, I don't know what he says about blind tests. I watched a video of him for half an hour. I couldn't make heads and tails out of his position of what he thinks uh, uh, on this thing. But uh, know that there's good science in here, blind tests and training and so forth. It's part and parcel of research, go to the Engineering Society, and there's tons and tons of papers there that talk about these things. Okay, hopefully you found this useful. I'm sorry it doesn't have as many graphs and measurements and things. Uh, I think listening tests are critical. 
uh, you know, we listen, I listen. Two thirds of my reviews have listening tests in them. A lot of people keep asking, why are you just reading graphs? I'm like, no, I'm listening. You know, you're the one that doesn't listen. I've listened to 140 speakers last year alone. How many speakers you've listened to and compared in a controlled environment uh, on this thing? So hopefully you got something out of this rant and, and video. Uh, comment below and tell me if you find it useful and uh, uh, or not. Okay, see you in future uh, videos. Bye-bye.